everybody to this live webinar on public procurement rules and policy for research infrastructures. This is part of uh, a right train webinar series. A right train is a Horizon 2020 research project, and this is also part of our uh, executive master in management of research infrastructure, which is part of a right train. Uh, today, we have uh, um, a discussion on uh, public procurement for research infrastructures, and uh, we have uh, uh, our guest speaker, Hoad Graber Sodri. Uh, Hoad is um, CEO of Ex Officia, a consultancy and legal a consultancy firm, and was also former um, head of legal division of uh, ESS. And we have also have um, the panelist, uh, Professor Carla Gulotta, my colleague here at the University of Minnesota, who is the leading um, of the module of international law and compliance, which is, which is part of our executive master in management research infrastructure. Uh, just uh, a few words about uh, the, this webinar details. And so um, a recording will be available after the webinar, so it will, you can watch it later. Uh, we will have a lecture from OAD and then uh, a full Q&A sessions, and you can use the Q&A box. Or to request to speak, uh, please click raise an icon that appears next to your name, and I will give you the permission to speak. Of course, we are on Twitter, so please tweet about this webinar using the Henry hashtag or Raytrain hashtag. Um, so now, Hoad, uh, the floor is yours, and you can start uh, your presentation. And let's start. Please, Hoad. Thank you, Enrico. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I hope you hear me well. Um, so I'm just trying to get uh, onto my slides. And in the meanwhile, um, I just uh, introduce myself again. Uh, my name is Ohad Graber Sudri, and I am the um, uh, CEO of uh, Ex Officio, which is a consultancy specializing in providing legal and procurement support to research uh, infrastructures and their business partners. <clears throat> we will discuss public procurement uh, regulation by research infrastructures. After a short introduction, we, uh, I will save you a few words, uh, very high level on the EU legal framework for public procurement. Uh, and then we'll also consider whether this uh, legal framework applies to research infrastructures, or in other words, which research infrastructures are exempt from the EU uh, procu procurement uh, legal framework. <clears throat> uh, and then we will move to uh, discuss key issues in drafting public procurement rules for research infrastructures. And if we have uh, time left, we will also say a few words about uh, the rights uh, uh, of uh, tenders bidding for contracts with research infrastructures in uh, Europe. So uh, what are public procurement rules? Procurement rules are principles and detailed procedures uh, to be applied by research infrastructures when purchasing operationally required goods, services, or works. Broadly speaking, the rules are aimed at ensuring that certain principles are abided by the research infrastructures while conducting their procurement activity. For example, principles such as transparency, equal treatment, best value for money, or other policies that the research infrastructure is uh, concerned about and would like to promote. Most procurement systems or procurement rules also grant suppliers certain rights, uh, which they can then enforce against the research infrastructure in case there was a deviation from the rules or a breach of the rules, or in case their suppliers feel that they've been treated unfairly. Public bodies in the European Union are bound by a regulation of, of, uh, of procurement uh, in the European Union. And we may want to say a few words about this legal framework that applies uh, to public bodies. As we will see later, uh, some or even many of the research infrastructures may be caught by these regulations. So um, this is not an attempt really to describe the, 
a complex set of laws on public procurement, but really high level. Uh, it is useful to, um, to identify several layers of legislation that is applicable to procurement activity in the European Union. The very basic one is the EU treaty, or the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, which sets out uh, very basic uh, obligations, uh, which I'll explain in a minute. The next layer is the EU Public Procurement Directives. These directives provide quite a detailed set of, of laws, uh, of regulations, uh, to regulate the activity of public procurement in the EU. The directives are also implemented into national law in each one of the member states. And due to the quite detailed nature of the directives, there is little, very little difference in the uh, national laws regulating or implementing those directives. Uh, I'll say a few words about these two levels, which are the main levels of regulations. But for completion, it's also important to mention <clears throat> that um, there's also the EU case law, which is case law given by the European Court of Justice or Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, as its formal name is. And this case law helps uh, and provides guidance in the interpretation of both the principles set out in the EU treaty and which are relevant to procurement activity and to the interpretation of the rather complex public procurement directives. And then there's also something which is uh, less relevant to research infrastructures. Uh, these are international or bilateral agreements uh, on procurement to which the European Union uh, is a party to. So just a few words about um, the uh, EU treaty. Uh, I've mentioned that this is the very basic uh, layer of uh, law. The EU treaty uh, includes uh, certain basic obligations or uh, articles which are relevant to public procurement. The most important is non-discrimination on grounds of nationality, which means in practical terms that uh, supplier based in uh, or established in one member state uh, deserve to equal treatment uh, or deserve not to be discriminated <clears throat> in relation to suppliers that are based in another member state, usually where the contracting entity or the research infrastructure is based. So all suppliers uh, based in any EU member state are entitled to uh, not to be discriminated uh, because of their location in procurement procedures. The next relevant articles are those on the free movement uh, principles, which is the free uh, movement of goods and uh, freedom to provide services, as well as freedom of establishment, which again um, has been, of course, discussed uh, in the legal uh, profession uh, quite a lot and in the case law. And these are also aimed at enabling a pan-European competitive market, uh, which will allow uh, real and effective competition between suppliers. In the case of procurement, those suppliers that compete for contracts with public entities. There are other uh, relevant principles that have been developed mainly by the case law. I think the most relevant are equal treatment and transparency. Even more transparency, which is quite a broad principle that has been applied in many different situations, <clears throat> ranging from uh, an obligation of advertisement of contract opportunities EU-wide, uh, to uh, obligation on contracting authorities to provide sufficient information to bidders uh, to be able to know, for example, how their proposal have been assessed, um, and also keeping uh, 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 keeping an audit trail of the procurement process, producing documents to demonstrate that uh, the obligations set out in the rules have been complied with and uh, that bidders could also uh, examine, and of course the court could examine the legality of the actions being taken. However, the EU treaty itself was not considered uh, sufficient to address 
all the problems in the area of public procurement in the European Union. <clears throat> and actually since the 70s already and later on more developed, uh, most recently 2014, a uh, set of uh, directives have been adopted uh, uh, and being enforced. And again, this is not an attempt to describe what they contain. They are quite lengthy and complex and detailed, but uh, this is an attempt to provide a non-comprehensive non-comprehensive list of uh, basic principles that um, uh, are contained in the directives. Uh, first of all, very important, as I've mentioned, is EU-wide advertisement of contract opportunities. This is in a so-called official journal of the European Union. Uh, those who are caught by the directives must publish all their contract opportunities above a certain uh, monetary threshold. Uh, in the official journal of the European Union. Uh, the directives also prescribe quite detailed procurement procedures. Most of you will be familiar with them, uh, such as the uh, open procedure or uh, restricted procedure, negotiated procedure or, or competitive dialogue. There are also more uh, esoteric procedures which are actually relevant to some research infrastructures, such as um, uh, innovation partnership. I will not uh, say much about this now. Um, other parts, the uh, directives provide quite detailed rules on selection and award criteria. So selection is basically pre-qualifying uh, suppliers and then award criteria, what kind of criteria may be used to assess the so-called most economically advantageous tender, which will then be awarded the contract. Other rules in the directives include uh, on technical specifications, which again is quite important to make sure um, uh, and public bodies do not um, uh, tailor basically contracts to specific suppliers. And in relation to transparency, also communication and reporting obligations. And uh, last for this slide is um, certain rights <clears throat> and possibility for, uh, for bidders to take action against a public entity in case of breach of the rules and the guarantee of minimum level of, of uh, remedies, for example, damages or the ability to set aside award decisions. So having uh, discussed uh, a little bit the, uh, the EU framework on public procurement, the EU legal framework on public procurement. Um, that begs the questions, what rules apply to research infrastructures? And the answer to that is that the answer, the answer would depend on the legal status of the research infrastructure. And in this slide, I have tried to uh, categorize research infrastructures uh, into five different uh, categories of uh, legal status and I will then try to um, identify the legal obligations or the, the procurement rules that would apply to each one of them. So starting with a very basic um, arrangement which is uh, common in research infrastructures which are either have simply a loose arrangement or they are kind of in the beginning of the way and considering uh, the next step to incorporate themselves. And that would be a sort of collaboration uh, when there's no separate legal uh, entity or personality and there's some kind of a contractual arrangement between other units that belong to different institutions or the institutions themselves. And that would usually be by way of an MOU. In that case, if there are also procurement activities, they would usually be conducted by a mother organization, which is uh, which the uh, which the research infrastructure uh, belongs to, and then it will very much depend on the legal status of that mother organization. In most cases, uh, they will be caught by the EU. Uh, rules on public procurement, because these would usually be public entities such as uh, publicly funded research institutions, universities, or any other public uh, body. In some cases, it does, doesn't have to be the case. Uh, in some cases, there could be a situation where an, actually an international organization uh, 
uh, act as kind of the uh, mother entity. And then they would uh, conduct the procurement for uh, those kind of arrangements, and that would be according to their rules. As we will see later on, international organizations are not uh, subject to the EU framework. Next are research infrastructures that are incorporated under national law, so using one of the national vehicles, for example, a limited liability company or a GmbH, or an association, for example, the Belgian International Association or a Verein in Germany. Uh, and these would, um, although these research infrastructures would be incorporated under private law, they would very likely be caught with what uh, is called uh, the definition of a body governed by public law, <clears throat> which is a definition provided by the EU directives on procurement. Uh, there are a few conditions, but basically entities or research infrastructures that are financed by the state or in control by any other public entity, they would they will likely be caught by uh, the rules, which means that in most cases, although not all of them, uh, research infrastructures that are incorporated under national national vehicle will likely be caught by the EU directives on public procurement. Uh, again, for those contracts above certain threshold, um, and there are, of course, few exemptions, but largely they are caught by the EU uh, regulation of public procurement. The next level is the European level. <clears throat> Here it is my own private, really, category of what I call non-ERIC EU vehicles. And, and one example, which is actually not so much common, uh, commonly used, and therefore there's no, not worth spending much time on this, is the EEIG, or G, which I believe is the uh, European Economic Interest Group, which is some form of a legal entity for uh, certain activities. Uh, there's no point to discuss it because uh, I'm, I don't think it's very relevant anymore today. Now with the introduction of the ERIC, the European Research Infrastructure Consortia. And here it's worth saying a few words. Uh, those of you who are familiar uh, or engaged with uh, ERIC would know uh, or have heard that ERICs are exempt from uh, EU law on public procurement, uh, but the reality is that this is partially correct. And it's worth making two points in relation to uh, this common understanding. One is that it is true that ERICs are exempt from the directive on public procurement, but ERICs are not exempt from the EU treaty obligations, which I've mentioned before. Now, the EU, the, the point is that EU treaty obligations uh, are subject to interpretation by the European courts, and these have uh, actually expanded these principles quite significantly to include certain positive obligations uh, of actual uh, specific actions to be taken if it's publicity or if it is ensured in a certain way that the procurement process is conducted. And therefore, for ERICs <clears throat> that believe that they are completely exempt from the EU law on procurement, uh, they should think again, uh, especially if they have uh, uh, rather or at least uh, substantial procurement activity. In order to abide by the EU principles, it would be advisable for these ERICs to develop um, uh, some procurement rules to be able to comply with their obligations from the EU treaty. These rules obviously could be quite simple and depending on their procurement activity, uh, but they will ensure that uh, even though the directives do not apply, they still abide by the EU principles which I've mentioned. The other point to make in relation to ERICs, and this I believe many ERICs are not aware of, is that when one looks at the reference, in fact, the ERIC regulation provides a reference to Article 9 of the, which is now Article 9 of the new uh, directives on public procurement. And one point which uh, is quite interesting and could be very relevant is that the exemption from the directive does not only apply to ERIC being um, equivalent to an international organization, but also to third parties that are obliged to follow the ERIC procurement rules. 
Now, what does it mean? It means that provided the ERIC has developed their own procurement rules, and these are different from the EU directive, which is likely to be the case, then if other parties, for example, in-kind partners or uh, hubs, which, have, which actually, uh, again, the hubs in a distributed ERIC, when they are actually subject to another legal entity, um, if they could demonstrate that they are obliged to follow the ERIC procurement rules, uh, for example, if the ERIC pays for that activity, for example, then they may also be exempt from the uh, EU directives, which makes life much easier to many entities. Uh, and that is a point which has been uh, a little bit overlooked, but in order to do that, the ERICs will have, will, must have their own procurement rules, and therefore, <clears throat> for these two reasons, it is quite advisable for ERICs to give some thought to, um, uh, to the way they want to go about their procurement and not to leave it only at the level of principle of competition and transparency and equal treatment, which is stated in most of the statutes there. Right. Um, and the next level, of course, is uh, research infrastructures, which are organized as an international organization. Here, uh, in this case, they will be exempt both from the EU treaty and from the directives, and they would have uh, full flexibility to develop their own uh, procurement policy or procurement rules. I have set out a table in the next slide, let me get there, uh, which summarizes my observations. Maybe one point to make in relation to international organizations, it's a little bit academic, but uh, there is a discussion, there is a, it is actually academic discussion <coughs> um, whether international organizations which are composed of EU member states only can still be exempt from the EU directives. Some argue that in these situations the exemption would not apply. Uh, some argue differently. Uh, as I said, it is an academic uh, discussion. Uh, there has not been, uh, this has not been tested yet uh, anywhere. And the reality is that uh, most or all international organizations actually follow their own procurement rules unless they are sponsored by the European Commission or the European Commission is a significant member, in which case it's likely they will follow uh, some financial regulations which are either the same or very similar to those of the European Commission. Okay. Having looked at the legal status of uh, different research infrastructures, you can see by the table uh, in this slide uh, that for ERICs and international organizations, there are rather large, uh, a lot of scope to develop their own procurement rules, and they should do it. Uh, whereas to other research infrastructures, there will be limited, if any, scope to develop uh, their uh, procurement rules unless they are exempt for whatever other reason from the procurement rules, in which case they could follow their own principles. And that leads us to the next uh, question or issue, and that is actually drafting procurement rules and what would be relevant considerations. And I've tried to put on this slide uh, some considerations. This is by no means a comprehensive list of considerations, uh, but if I may, just pick up on a couple of them, uh, and I could say a few words, uh, starting, of course, from the issue of the legal status. So one thing a research infrastructure would like to do as a first step is to uh, identify and to understand what rules, if any, apply to them uh, in reference to the European, of course, European rules on procurement, uh, and just to make sure that they are not caught by them, because then there's no point to develop uh, something else which will actually be illegal. Uh, and that will be done, obviously, uh, uh, in the same lines as our discussion so far. Next, uh, worth thinking of is the actual scope of procurement activity. So, in, when developing procurement rules, there's no such thing as one size uh, fits all, because some research infrastructures may have <clears throat> quite uh, demanding, especially if it's capital intensive research infrastructure, and there will be a significant construction or project type of, um, of effort. Uh, in that case, project schedule would be 
probably the most uh, or one of the most important considerations and and that has to be taken into account when drafting procurement rules especially when thinking about issues such as time scales or how complex uh, the procedures should be uh, you there is a limit how much uh, procurement uh, professionals can handle and if there are many procurement uh, running and especially if time scales are, are let's say generous uh, towards uh, the market uh, you may find yourself in a delay in a project which will cost much more than any uh, value for money you've managed to achieve by being uh, uh, very thorough in your procurement process so maybe thorough is not the right word, but uh, you should always be thorough in your procurement process, but um, you should also be realistic uh, and understand quite well what type of activity uh, will actually be procured. Um, the other point uh, which is uh, worth uh, picking up on is joint procurement. In many cases, or at least in some cases, uh, research infrastructures will conduct joint procurement activity. Now, this may become a problem if um, <clears throat> one research infrastructure follows their own independent procurement rules, for example, an ERIC or uh, an international organization, and they have to collaborate and to carry out a joint procurement activity with other entities which are actually subject to the EU procurement directives. So one may want to give some thoughts to that, how that will happen in practice, and maybe include certain provisions in their own procurement rules uh, to enable that activity uh, to be taken. Another point uh, to think of is whether the research infrastructure has <clears throat> substantial in-kind activity or in-kind arrangement, uh, because uh, the experience is that with in-kind arrangements, um, first of all, they have to be separate from procurement activity and they should be not confused or should not slowly uh, take the form of an actual procurement contract and sometimes that may be the case due to very many other reasons such as VAT considerations or any national arrangements of the in-kind relating to the in-kind delivery uh, and therefore there's always a risk that an in-kind arrangement would be at some point suddenly caught by the procurement rules and as you may know or most of you know uh, in-kind arrangements are usually the, uh, are um, are agreed in a different way and the in-kind partner has been identified uh, long in advance so there's no really uh, possibility to then go and procure an in-kind partner so this is something one may want to think about especially if you're again eric on an international organization uh, to uh, make sure there's a clear distinction between these two type of activities Another interesting point uh, is the issue of, uh, which will be more common in international uh, organizations, uh, is the, uh, for example, uh, the principle of just retour, which is, uh, in other words, uh, allocating contracts to the extent possible to uh, uh, members of the uh, research infrastructure, or more precisely, to companies based in the member state of the research infrastructure and there's very good reasons why one, one would like to do it uh, one of them is obviously to provide incentives for new members to join the research infrastructure especially if the contributions are high uh, just a tour is common in uh, some organizations uh, most notably CERN however um, it has its own problems of course uh, and one need to give thought to whether to what extent uh, value for money uh, should be compromised by these arrangements and also it has the inevitable effect that the governing bodies will be more and more involved in the procurement activity which should be remain largely at least in the hands of procurement professionals and that may in itself cause a lot of administrative waste in the organization uh, by producing reports and having interventions in the way procurement actually uh, done. So there's a little bit uh, thinking to be done around the way to for just the tool. There are many ways to achieve similar objectives. Uh, yeah. By the way, you may have gathered from the presentation that the practice of just the tool, for example, would not 
likely be in breach of the EU treaty principles, especially non-discrimination of ground of nationality, and therefore ERICS um, would not be able to include such a policy in their procurement rules unless all 28 member states of the European Union are members of the ERIC, and then they could still possibly uh, do that. Right. Um, let's move to the next slide. Yeah, here I, again, I've set a, a definitely non comprehensive list of basic principles for a healthy procurement policy. Uh, maybe I could pick up on one or two of these. Uh, if I had to choose one or two, I would first go to simplicity. So if you are a research infrastructure which is not bound by the EU directives and working on your procurement rules, and if you intend to develop uh, procurement rules which are equally or even more complex than the EU directives, then my advice would be simply drop it. Don't do it. The whole point of having an exemption for ERICS from the procurement rules or being able to do so for international organizations is actually to make life easier and not more complex. I would really encourage you to keep things uh, as simple as much as possible and thereby reduce uh, red tape and uh, questions uh, and a lot of discussions uh, or trying to uh, imitate in certain ways uh, what's happening at the European level. Then uh, another point worth uh, mentioning and maybe I could move to the next slide already, is the rights or the review mechanism available for uh, leaders uh, to review procurement decisions. Now, at the EU level, there are certain uh, minimum rights guaranteed for bidders and certain remedies. And in some countries, uh, challenging a procurement process <clears throat> has almost became a national sport. And if you're running a complex project, uh, you don't have time to uh, deal with this. And in fact, if it goes to a court and uh, under the EU, uh, for example, there may be an automatic suspension of contract award, you may face delays, which may cost you, again, depending how capital intensive is your project, which may cost you much more than any damages that you'll end up paying. So having said that, there is a lot of value uh, at the same time in including um, effective review mechanism in your procurement rules. Uh, first of all, for sake of transparency and impartial, uh, uh, sorry, the, the procurement review, the review process should be transparent and impartial, and that is very important because at the end of the day, if you are a manager of a research infrastructure, you will not always be involved in the procurement activity. And in my experience, procurement professionals work best if they know that there is a possibility that someone will challenge their decision and, and they will have to face and to explain that. It may be a court, but it can also be somewhere else, another forum of uh, hearing procurement disputes. So, and given the fact that it would usually be bidders, other bidders and suppliers who are best placed uh, to know when things go wrong, they are those that are best placed to also to, um, uh, to shout stop, basically, when something goes wrong. And procurement, good procurement rules would enable them to do so. Because uh, otherwise, if there is no, if there are no effective remedies for uh, supplies, there will be no challenges. Uh, and then procurement professionals, not all, but some would find it easier to do things their own way which in the, in the good case, it will be simply um, dedicating less effort in the work. But in the bad case, it can also lead to corruption uh, and similar things like this. When it comes to ERICS uh, or any other entities which are also subject to EU law or the EU treaty, there's also issues of what we lawyers call the principle of effective judicial protection, meaning there's an obligation to provide an effective uh, mechanism, review mechanism, to be this uh, in procurement procedures, and that also includes often uh, equivalent remedies or certain remedies that will be uh, effective and sufficient and will not discourage them from submitting complaints on procurement decisions. <clears throat> 
I believe that was all from my side and I'm happy to take uh, any questions you have. I think there are also participants outside of the uh, uh, executive master program, so please do ask any question you like as long as it is, it is related to research infrastructures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oad, for your very interesting presentation. And uh, I really appreciate your one of the last points in terms of the interaction between managers uh, of an infrastructure and legal staff. Uh, and the attendees today, we have both, and so it will be very interesting to interact on uh, this topic. Um, please, uh, if you have questions, uh, raise your hand or use the chat. Oh, we have a lot of uh, raised hand. The first one is Ari Asmi. Please, Ari, you are allowed to speak. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yeah. Okay, just, just a brief thing, because we have actually been doing in ICOS Eric some procurement, and actually there we have just followed the national Finnish law on this issue. So just to make sure that, I mean, this is of course what you need to follow anyhow, and that actually puts you already in a quite tight box. So the degree of freedom of selecting your procurement policy isn't that big. Do I understand this correctly? And we have done this because of uh, that. I didn't even know about the directive issue, for example. Right. So, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, directives are actually implemented into national law. And what usually would uh, public entities would follow would be national law. They would not always look at the directive, and there's actually no need for them to do so. Yeah. So, if you have followed uh, uh, national law uh, in ICO, so I believe it will be uh, Finland, uh, then uh, you should be safe. However, um, as we discussed earlier, uh, there was no real need for you to do so, because if you are an ERIC, you are able to develop your own simple procurement rules, and you're not obliged to follow the, uh, the Finnish law on procurement, which is more complex. Uh, however, if you choose to remain with the EU law, you may do it, but then you also open the door uh, for uh, challenges with uh, uh, quite far sig uh, significant uh, implications to your procurement, and you put yourself in a way at a legal risk to find yourself before a court, before a Finnish court, something that you may avoid if you develop your own procurement rules and your own review mechanism. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Michela. Bellico, please, Michela. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, uh, so thank you for your interesting presentation. What I would like to ask is, is there any, is there any difference um, um, if an ERIC is hosted by a, an associated country instead of a member country? This is exam the example of Excel because the headquarters is in Norway. Norway is an associated country. So is there any difference in public procurement on that? Right, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> So, in the case of Norway, they actually uh, Norwegian procurement rules are very similar uh, to the EU rules because they are members of the EEA, uh, European Economic Area, and there are there are certain uh, arrangements. Um, uh, however, the fact that you and Eric uh, exempt you from the directives, and I'm quite convinced that that would exempt you from the Norwegian uh, rules as well. Uh, I would may need to double check that. But uh, it's quite quite sure that you uh, you all would be exempt from the same legislation in Norway, uh, being your own uh, your own Eric, as I said, having uh, uh, being able to benefit from the exemption which is in the Eric regulation. Uh, one will need to look again at the um, uh, at the arrangements with Norway. Um, I will look at this as well, but I'm I'm quite convinced this is the case. Thank you very much. Um, Ohad, we have uh, a question for the chat. Uh, the question is for an Eric, if uh, a member state pays for a certain expensive instrument, uh, is the Eric then bound to the national procurement rule of that particular member state? Sorry, Enrico, could you uh, could you repeat? I'm not sure about the question. If yes. a member, if yeah, we are talking about an Eric, and so yes. if the mem one member state pays for a certain expensive instrument. Is then the ERIC bound to the national procurement rule of that particular member state? Right. Uh, 
so that would be uh, that would be a question how do they pay and whether it, the question is whether they pay and there's a direct procurement on their behalf in which case uh, if the if the member again remember that members are actually ministries in the, or governments in the states it's not uh, uh, usually they don't carry they don't carry out procurement activities themselves. Members in the NERIC are only countries, they are not institutions. So I take your question to, to understand your question as being, if an institution, uh, which is, let's say, a representative entity, a representing entity in an NERIC, pays for the procurement themselves, and if they ask the ERIC to purchase on their behalf, so to speak, then, and that entity is subject to the EU rules, then the ERIC may be subject, may have to follow that because that would be a condition because they procure on their behalf. But to me, it sounds as if this is not really the case. Um, mere contribution to the ERIC uh, is, uh, is something else than then procuring by the ERIC. So my actually advice would be, uh, and that links uh, to the point which I made before, that the ERICs may develop their own procurement rules and all procurement should ideally be conducted by the ERIC because then they can benefit from the exemption to, um, uh, to the, uh, from the directives. The other situation that where I could think when uh, uh, certain entities pay for the contribution is an in-kind arrangement, but then it's not money that is being transferred rather than it's the actual delivery. And then there will be procurement by the delivering entity and that may indeed be subject to the EU directives or EU rules. Uh, Hi, Oad. Um, we have, um, we have uh, one uh, um, question from uh, Simone Campana. Uh, please, I would uh, um, ask two participants to um, clarify the organization where they come from. You can hear me? Yes, please, Simone. Uh, hi. So, um, I'm from CERN. Um, but the question is a bit more general. So uh, imagine you have a, a procurement, you have procurement rules uh, that uh, oblige you to procure from, uh, say, um, member state countries or uh, uh, EU countries. Um, does this apply also to pre-commercial procurement? Um, for example, you have to procure some edge technology which is not yet on the market, and you have a only a few companies that can procure this and not necessarily are uh, in uh, the list of countries from which uh, you are forced to procure. So how does that work in that case? Yeah, so uh, there's two points to make here. And uh, I think the situation you describe is, seems to be more related to procurement of innovation or pre-commercial procurement. And there are specific exemptions to these type of activities which uh, I didn't really want to go into this. It's more uh, a specific question here. So there would be usually certain uh, uh, exemptions for procurement of innovation, uh, especially if the technology is not uh, available in the market and there's a research and development stage and so on. Uh, if you come from CERN, you should not be concerned about this because CERN have their own procurement rules in any way and they're not bound by the EU uh, procurement directives. So I suppose that CERN will have uh, to follow their own uh, CERN also has just retour, so they would assume, some presumably respect, would follow that. Um, in some respect, in the sense that uh, some of the funding we have for procurement comes from um, EU grants. And as you said mm. correctly, those uh, um, need to apply to EU regulations rather than internal regulations. So it right. Fit what you said. Yes, yes. So, yes, that's a specific situation. But then I would say you should look at the uh, conditions and uh, there are exemptions. There are quite a few exemptions from the rules, and uh, innovation is one of them. And there's also a specific procedure for that. But in your case, what I understand is a very early stage, so it may be uh, exempt altogether. OK. Thanks. Uh, Ohad, there is a, a question. Um, these uh, rules uh, um, you have told us about, uh, what uh, about principles coming from outside the EU regime, for example, uh, World Trade Organization, would they be relevant for a research infrastructure not built up as an ERIC, for example, an international organization? 
Yes, so the way it works, and I think if my understanding is correct, you you mean the, in one of my first slides I mentioned there are also international or bilateral uh, agreements. Uh, WTO is, uh, is an international agreement and uh, trade, and there's also a specific agreement under the WTO which is called Government Procurement Agreement, and there there's uh, more than 40 uh, countries which are member to this agreement. And they have committed to open up uh, their mar procurement markets to each other. So they will include uh, all 20, all, all, all the members of the all member states of the European Union, and also countries outside the European Union, which will enjoy uh, similar rights to access uh, public contracts in the EU. However, the way these agreements are structured. Uh, and that's actually slightly different from the uh, procurement uh, directives. They have uh, uh, certain uh, schedules at the end of the uh, agreement, and the schedule identifies both the contracting uh, authorities that are subject to the agreement and the type of activity which is uh, open on equal terms to non-EU members. <clears throat> In most cases, the research that I'm familiar with and what I've looked at uh, research infrastructures will not be included in these uh, schedules and therefore uh, uh, should not worry about this. Uh, research infrastructures should not worry about this. It would be irrelevant for them and usually it's enough to just to follow the... Uh, if you're subject to the EU rules, you just follow them. But if you're not and if you're an international organization or an ERIC, you're very unlikely to be covered or I would say almost impossible to be covered by these agreements. Uh, thank you, Ohad. We have another question. From Please, uh, Andrew Williams, you can speak now. No. So we have another one from Christine Kubiak. Please, Christine. Hello. You. Yes, please. We hear okay. you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. It's just a clarification, maybe related to the question. Um, please, Christine, clarify uh, your organization, please. Okay, I'm I'm working for Ecran, uh, which is an Eric. And uh, just my question related to the um, to the clarification. Uh, do I understand correctly that if we receive some funding, uh, for example, from the EU Commission, uh, we have to follow uh, the EU directive and not our own uh, procurement rules? Yes, so uh, it's a very nice question, which I've heard before. And the <laughs> there are two understandings to this uh, um, question. And I don't want to take side in this case although I may be willing to do that in uh, different circumstances. The, um, on the one hand, the, European, the, the agreement, usually it's a grant agreement that requires you to follow the EU, uh, uh, to comply with EU law on public procurement. And complying with the EU law on public procurement is following the directives, basically complying with the directives. And therefore, one could argue you need to apply the procedures. On the other hand, uh, following your own procurement rules, as an ERIC, it's exactly what you do. You follow the procurement directives, because in Article 9 of the procurement directives, there is an exemption for the type of activity you do. So, uh, one could uh, uh, play around this argument. I will not take sides at this point of time, uh, but there's a way to argue against it. Um, um, probably we have uh, times for one of the last questions. Um, Oad, we have uh, uh, questions uh, for Eric's and Igos uh, that receive funding from EU sources. Are they obliged to follow EU rules when procurement are made under the grant agreement? For example, purchasing equipment for an uh, ERC grant? That, uh, in these grant agreements, there will be provisions. Uh, it's a standard provisions on compliance with public procurement and state aid and that require you to spend the money in accordance with the procurement directives. Um, again, the argument against it is to say, well, we are following the procurement directives because there are specific exemption in the directives that allow us to follow our own rules. Uh, it has not been tested yet, and um, so I will not uh, say exactly uh, my full position now, but it could be argued.
Uh, Ohad, just a last question. Uh, would you advise uh, research infrastructure which have uh, general principles on public procurement in their statutes to develop more precise, more um, articulated rules? What, what is your yeah. point <laughs> yes. on this? Certainly, and I've touched upon this in the presentation. I would certainly recommend that. And uh, the level of the rules, uh, it, doesn't have, it can be a one page. It could be two pages, uh, depending on the activity that they carry out. Uh, if there is not much procurement activity, there's no need almost to develop very complex. Uh, or, but if it's more um, uh, activity, uh, then they should certainly develop their own rules, because if they don't do that, they are most likely to do something wrong on the way. As I mentioned, to be in breach of, uh, although they are exempt from the procurement directives, they will not be exempt from the EU treaty principles and therefore they expose themselves to a challenge or to a complaint to the European Commission. The second reason why they should do it is uh, because, and this is something which has been often overlooked by many of the discussions we had with Eric, is that uh, Eric's that develop their own procurement rules and then third parties are obliged to follow, and then uh, those third parties could also benefit from the exemption. So, uh, and sometimes there's an issue with, uh, with third parties providing, uh, doing certain purchases uh, that they would like to do it in a simpler way, and that is a good platform to enable them to do this. To do this. Okay, thanks. So well, the, the answer is certainly, uh, it is very much recommended. Uh, thank you, Hod. Um, we have no more questions to answer. I would like to emphasize that the importance uh, of uh, knowledge of some of the basic of legal basics uh, for applying to research infrastructure for scientific uh, uh, responsible of uh, research infrastructure, because as you emphasize, pointed out before, it is important for um, top senior level managers to interact with the legal staff, make the right questions, and it's also important to have some clear um, challenges of legal changes of um, the legal status of infrastructure, especially for those who are in the design or in the prep phase, to know which are the um, challenges of different legal status, um, especially for procurement as well. Um, so I'm very happy of your presentation, very interesting. Now it's time to close. Uh, first of all, thank you to all for joining today our webinar. I, we certainly appreciate your attendance and participation, and um, we hope you enjoyed this conversation with Hoan. Um, the uh, webinar has been recorded, so it will be, we, we, you can watch it later. And uh, again, thank you for, for joining. Um, I wish you a wonderful continuation. Take care. Bye thank now. you very much indeed. Thank you to you all.